Okay, this is Think Tech Global Connections. I'm Jay Fidel, and I have the honor uh, of, of doing a show here about <laughs> Southeast Asia with Yukari Kunasui. She just came back. Hi, Yukari. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for bringing me here. Yeah. And I love the map behind us. Yeah. It shows exactly where I was. Yeah. I'm excited. Well, I mean, this, you know, it's a special cachet sort of thing, and I feel that, you know, a lot of people have been in Japan and China, Korea, all that, Taiwan, maybe, um, and Australia, New Zealand, and maybe Malaysia and Indonesia, maybe, but mm. Southeast Asia, these countries on the peninsula there, they're very interesting, and I also feel, and maybe you will join me in this, that they're, um, they're not going to stay that way. Mm. They're changing. Mm. They're, they're moving into, you know, the 21st century. Okay. And, you know, the exquisite things that you can see there now, find mm. there, historic, cultural, um, remarkable things, maybe old things, maybe even developing country poor things, right. but not forever. Yeah? Right. What do you think about that? Well, that's a good point. But yes and no, there are parts really progressively moving forward. But also the area that I went, which I am going to talk about a little bit later, for instance, northern part of the Vietnam, uh, where we went near the highest mountain in Vietnam called Phan Si Pan where people are still living in the dirt. And so there are mixtures of that. And uh, in contrast, of course, a big city like Ho Chi Minh City, which used to be called Saigon, is just moving forward really fast paced. So I can see your point. Yeah, it's interesting that uh, uh, Vietnam is different from the others. And mm -hmm. Thailand is to some extent too, but mm -hmm. Vietnam had the American influence. Mm -hmm. You know, war leaves an influence. And mm -hmm. the American influence is, you know, right on through Vietnam, both right. north and south. And, right. and so you can see it there. And you can right. see that you can immediately conclude, I, I'm really asking you, that it would not be the same had there not been the American influence. Right? Oh, Just yeah, like Japan, too. Yeah. You know? All over Asia, for that matter. You said American influence, but also French influence, Hungary, Vietnam yeah. and Cambodia and Laos. So there are French colonies. So you can see those influences as well. But I wanted to give you some highlight that I had. Please. So first we went to southern part of Vietnam and then northern part. And I went on to Cambodia and Thailand. So the no southern part of Vietnam is uh, Ho Chi Minh City. And it's a booming town. It's like uh, uh, Shanghai is uh, in China's maybe Ho Chi Minh versus Beijing is Hanoi. It's a uh, political town. So there, everything is really progressing fast. Wi-Fi system is superb. Uh, restaurants and all the young people's energy is really vibrant. And one of the uh, places that I went was called uh, New Progressive Idea Restaurant, I guess. And it's called Noir. And Noir, as you know, that means black or dark in French, right? as you said, in a French conference. And Noir is a restaurant is hire only blind or visually impaired uh, waiter and waitresses. And us, the clients, going in in the pitch dark restaurant. And you experience this while eating very nice meal. And it's nothing like you know, you close your eyes, open it, same thing, it's dark. But then it really gives you an opportunity, dining experience that you can't really have in a regular restaurant because your eyesight is deprived. Sensory deprivation. Exactly. Then what happens is your senses, smells, textures, tongues oh. are really enhanced. And my partner who uh, I went with said, it felt like he was in the spirit, spirit eating a food. And it's not like human being eating, dining, or that. So that was interesting. Very, yeah, it was a very interesting experience. And if you have any chance to go to Ho Chi Minh City, it's in District 1, it's called Noir. Maybe you can show the pictures a little bit here. Yeah. This is the place. Uh, Noir, and then you can see sister restaurant called Blanc which is actually Just for the, the opposite. People. opposite. It means white. And it is a restaurant for deaf people. So you have to use the sign language to order food, 
requesting where the bathroom, that sort of thing. It was very progressive. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Mm. So, big question. Would those, yes. would those places work? I mean, you look at it from a psychological point of view, deprivation, sensory deprivation mm -hmm. point of view. It's, mm -hmm. it's so interesting. So, uh, what's the word? It's uh, engaging. It's a provocative notion of doing mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So, would they work in Japan? Would they work in the U.S.? Would they work in Hawaii? That's a very good question. I heard that there is a similar concept restaurant in San Francisco area. Maybe it's progressive. I believe there is none in Hawaii yet, but I think it's definitely a very good um, concept, especially helping people with uh, disabilities. And as you can imagine, it's very hard to find uh, employment, but they provide um, good training and also give uh, regular clientele uh, more, how do you say, experience, what it's like to be in disability. Yeah, I forgot to mention uh, that uh, Yukari is a psychologist. Is that okay for me to tell you? Yeah, tell sure, okay. sure. <laughs> and so she sees the world through the lens of psychology. It's different than regular people, you know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I am not a regular person. So right. what's the profile of, of the Vietnamese these days? Those kids, for example. Right. Uh, what are they like? Can you de describe them? Very vibrant, very hungry, very motivated. They want to learn Japanese. They want to learn English. They want to go outside the world. Oops, not quite yet. This picture is actually moved on. <laughs> this is a picture from the northern part of Vietnam. Uh -huh. uh, it's called Sapa area, mountain rural town. Let's look again. Yeah, let's look again. And this uh, particular picture was taken at the center of Sapa town. And these uh, people are wearing very uh, colorful Hmong H O H M O N G, Mon people. This is another kid. Well, those kids are cute. They're cute, and they look like, I don't know if you can notice, but quite different from Vietnamese features. They are more basically um, Chinese descendant, but they are between uh, China's and Vietnam's border, mm. and they are left in very basic lifestyle. Maybe you can show the next picture with. Um, yeah. Okay, so you can see this is the local uh, house that we had a lunch, and he, she's still cooking in a dirt uh, floor house, living with buffaloes and chickens and all that kind of thing. It's like a Hawaii some time ago, right? But she's cooking an excellent meal there, and you have only one oven like that on the uh, floor. Well, the magic that you can get with a cell phone camera. You told me this was a cell phone camera. Well, it's yeah. Unbelievable, huh? <laughs> well, I'm not very good. <laughs> Talking about cell phones, in this northern part of uh, Vietnam, we uh, decided to do trekking. And as I said, this is the area that originally came from China, and the rice is a big deal. And so you can see terrace uh, rice fields here. And a lot of people are walking up and down these terrace fields, right? The trekking has to be done through the guide. And so we hired a guide from an organization called Sapa Sisters. And interestingly, guides are girls. And they were wearing this really colorful, the picture that I showed you, uh, outfit. And they move around like a goat. And we're going, <laughs> uh, but they're living in this very ba basic sort of ancient lifestyle. Yet, those Sapa girls had this iPhone coming <laughs> and bringing it out, and they were very progressive. Yeah. So the contrast was very All interesting. All over the world, isn't oh, it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And you know, iPhones, smartphones in general, they signify one thing, Facebook. Mm -hmm. I, I, I bet these kids, these people were on social media just mm -hmm. the way we are, no? Right, If right. not more. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's definitely everywhere. Maybe you can show the second picture here. What else we have? We had uh, me talking to this Hmong lady. She is about 50 something. And she showed uh, her, you see the background photo that I mm -hmm. think that was mm -hmm. her daughter's picture. And she was very proud. She was a widow and raised seven children on her own. Some of them became guides, making some money, pouring money bringing in. So she uh, was a happy lady. She actually served us this. Happy water, she called. Happy water. Happy water was, happened to be a, a alcohol. <laughs> it was 
enjoyed. Did you like Vietnam best of the places you visited? I wouldn't say best because each place has unique uh, features and unique history and unique ambiance, I think. And because we were in big cities and small town, also Hanoi we went, I liked each place. Yeah, yeah. Well, I could see you were getting out there in the, in the, uh, in the rural areas <laughs> right, and enjoying right. whatever is there because that's the true culture. That's where it all comes from. I there. think so, but it's still touristy. I was just a tourist, so it's nothing like I was, uh, you know, yeah. NPO or NGO or anything like that. But it's just you get the glimpse of it. Before the break, why don't we mm -hmm. talk about one more country okay. in, in your trip? Okay. Mm, very quickly, then, I went to Thailand, Chiang Mai, because of the Lantern uh, Festival. Mm -hmm. uh, but we ended up uh, not staying in Lantern Festival, because Lantern Festival, Hawaii has that in Ala Moana too, right? It goes to the ocean. But this Lantern Festival, uh, the Lantern goes up because of there. Above the Above, streets. Yeah. yeah. But because of the going up, coming down, it caused some accidents and so fires and stuff. Oh, so government no. decided not Terrible. to do this. But I had a very interesting experience. And how much time do I have here? Because I want to talk about interesting place. Well, let's, let's move on, whatever comes to mind. Okay, you okay. Know? So I chose to go to this massage center, and I'm sure our viewers know Thai massage. A very unique. Famous, world famous. Oh, yeah. So, it's some, like, some, ah. some men go without telling their wives. Well, go, my <laughs> place wasn't like that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and so Thai massage is originally, you might have heard, that I came originally, oh, this is the picture that she's doing, uh, Thai massage. Ayurveda, Indian uh, medicine science, that was the origin I heard. And sometimes people call this one two persons yoga. Okay, so you can see this one. So maybe, I don't know if you can see the sign. It says, Women's Massage Center by Ex-Prisoners. Oh. So these ladies were actually inmates, or war, war inmates before. Oh. And so this is a part of the employment enhancement program. And as you can see, once you are imprisoned, uh, it's very hard to find employment after you come out. So they ended up repeating the same type of thing. So in Thailand, women prisoners are 80% um, I heard is drug related. Amphetamine and cocaine and spending drugs. They become strict about it. Right, and they became very strict about it. So women prisoners are ever increasing. <laughs> and they come out, there's no job, go back out. In again, in and out, oh, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this helps them break the, this break helps the circle. Them. Yeah. And as I said, two person yoga, it's not only the person who receives massage, but also masseuse is being healed. So that's the kind of uh, reciprocal kind of healing modality I heard. So that was very interesting. So what's, what's your profile, your profile of the ties? What are they like? Mm, well, as you mentioned, it's much more middle class compared to the northern part of Vietnam or Cambodia that I went. Uh, I felt, well, price-wise, it's a little bit more expensive, and people are much more affluent, it looks like. Huh. And, and because of the political stability, more or less, compared to other countries, people seem to be a little bit more relaxed. There, there, there is a certain amount of affluence. Oh yeah, definitely. I remember definitely. all the shops, extraordinary shops. Mm, yeah. And uh, and uh, the shopping centers and and trains and subways. Mm -hmm. I mean, not subways, elevated railways. Right. Maybe Bangkok and, and Bangkok, the big city. Yeah, like, that was like that. extraordinary. Chiang Mai is a little bit uh, different because it's a northern, uh, old, ancient city with lots of temples and all that. But I can feel, and also the tourists tend to go to the southern part of Tha uh, Thailand which is more uh, affluent because of the tourist money, going, money coming in. Before we go to this break, I'll tell you a short story about a fellow who gave a, a talk at the China Seminar a few years ago. And he, uh, he left uh, New York, where he was born and raised, and he went to China in the early days, and he slipped into China, drove a taxi cab. He managed to be, be able to drive a taxi cab in, in Shanghai. Huh. And he did that for a couple of years until, uh, and he learned Mandarin. Yeah? 
Wow. Um, and uh, he did that for a couple of years until they caught up with him and they said, you're going to have to leave. You can't stay here. Mm. He said, where shall I go? And they said, well, why don't you go to Taiwan? You know, you can, you know, use your Mandarin in Taiwan and everything. He says, uh, well, I can't go to Taiwan. I don't speak Thai. <laughs> Wrong Thai, <laughs> okay, dear. On that note, Wrong Thai. <laughs> we're going to take a short break. <laughs> Aloha, Stan the Energy Man here. You can see me every Tuesday at 3 p.m. here on Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, we're not on Friday anymore, so don't be looking for me on Friday. I'm on Tuesday at 3 here on Think Tech, coming to you live and direct from the beautiful studios in downtown Honolulu's Pioneer Plaza. So please join me, and we'll talk everything about hydrogen and clean energy, not only for Hawaii, but for the whole wide world. Aloha. Hey, aloha everyone, and welcome to the Think Tech Hawaii studio. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii. We air here every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Hawaii time, trying to bring you issues about security that you may not know, issues that can protect your family, protect yourself, protect our community, protect our, our companies, the folks we work with. Uh, please join us, and I uh, hope you can um, maybe get a little different perspective on how to live a little safer. Aloha. Yeah, we're back in Southeast Asia, <laughs> Kari Kunasui. We're talking about her trip and some of the really interesting, provocative things that she saw, learned, and enjoyed over there. Um, it's not a travel log; it's a sort of a uh, an understanding and evaluation. Personal impressions. Yeah, yeah. cultural impressions. Right, that, right. Okay? Yeah. Uh, so we have some pictures that we want to show again. So what what have you got? Yeah. Oh, we saw this one already. This is the Noir outside. Uh, it's a restaurant that I described in Ho Chi Minh City. It used to be called Saigon, as you know. That's Noir restaurant. Okay, here I am. I'm in the northern Vietnam wearing a um, uh, black man's outfit. And they're all handmade, hemp uh, made. And then ladies are using their own fingers and dye, with indigo dye. And you can see some aprons and headbands and those are the things not just for the occasions they wear this one every day it's me i've seen that picture that she's standing in front of i've seen that somewhere it's uh, yeah. yeah and you brought some art back what did you bring back what did you like that you brought it back what did i like the art what what is it you brought some art back no i did not ah. <laughs> i just impression is back oh, okay, okay. Photos back. so what was your impression what did you like about it you know that made it special Made, made you take the picture, for example. And uh, the well, picture. it's really uh, kind of nostalgic, to be honest with you. I remember my great-grandma making things, and maybe not in exactly the same way, but we used to make things in handmade, not store, kind of. Yeah. So that made me feel like, well, we used to live like this. And that's what I really liked about yeah, most. Yeah, yeah I... I you know, the, the art, uh, the design points, mm. you wouldn't see them generally right. in the U.S. You wouldn't see them in Hawaii, even though Hawaii is largely an Asian mm -hmm. place. And so that's, you know, travel is broadening. Right, definitely. Yeah. And, and the one thing I wanted to offer you and see your reaction is mm -hmm. this. It's, it's more than just that you learn stuff. Right. It's that you have ideas you never had before. Exactly. You put things together, like the noir and blanc thing. Right, um, right. You know, somebody watching this might decide to do the same or try the same yeah, thing Yeah, please here. do, I think. You know? So like you said, to me, traveling is, yes, superficially speaking, you are seeing other world, other parts of the world, but it's actually seeing yourself. What that reflects in you. So like you said, I didn't know this exists. I didn't know I had this kind of reaction. And so it's more like inner journey as well as outside <sighs> journey. Oh, oh, that's gonna be on the final exam. I'm telling you that. <laughs> yeah, I'm a psychologist. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, so you wanted to cover more on what? Well, yes, I want to talk about Cambodia. Yeah. And I went there basically because Angkor Wat, as you know, it's a, a world UNESCO heritage. And you've probably seen the pictures. I didn't bring the picture today, but a you know, very famous uh, sunrise from this uh, Hindu, originally Hindu or Buddhist temple. It's beautiful, sacred. Um, and also, there are a couple, it's, this town is full of temples. So you get templed out. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so the temples were impressive, uh, all the Buddhist images. But to me, most impressed part is the recent history of Cambodian people, which was I was still I was already high school I think in nineteen seventies, and they were suffering. This is right after uh, American left. Uh, we call Vietnam War, but in Vietnam they call American War, as you can see. Yeah. So after that, the balance of the Asian region has really changed. In Cambodia, previously a communist uh, labor party uh, led by Pol Pot, the name of the leader, became very powerful and tried to re-educate all the city rulers and intellectuals, just like China did. And what they ended up doing was not, since 1975 uh, to 79, only for four years, they managed to kill two million Cambodian their own people. Own people. It's like ethnic cleansing, except exactly. it's your own people. Exactly. <laughs> and this is uh, hard to believe. And in the 80s, you probably remember that there was a, a movie called Killing Feel. And I think it was a British movie. Uh, and recently, Angelina Jolie uh, made a movie based on the true story called First They Killed My Father, which uh, was made in 2016, I think. Yeah. I highly recommend if you're interested in this area or this region or history, and it's just part of this crazy massacre. Yeah. And I personally experienced meeting Cambodian people who remembered. Uh, sure, those, it wasn't that long ago. No, it is. You no, know, if you're fifties, they remember. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was a teenager. I was yeah. a little kid, and many of the Cambodian people. Do you have relatives and friends and neighbors for us? So that was a big part Powerful. as a tribe. But you know, you must ask. I mean, anyone not from Cambodia is going to go to Cambodia and know about mm -hmm. the killing fields mm -hmm. and Pol Pot and all mm -hmm. that, which is still a subject of great discussion, right. of international interest. Right. To try to figure out mm -hmm. what really happened. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is like madness that they yeah. kill their own people for no reason. Right. And so, did you think about that? Did of you come to any conclusions? Of course. What was your well, no conclusions? Through the lens of a psychologist now, <laughs> what could you conclude about, about the history of Cambodia, the culture of Cambodia, the people of Cambodia? Well, I don't have a conclusion. But what I could observe was, obviously, we can be cruel as much as anybody else can be to us. And that this happened to happen in this political ideas. I can just change the brain function. I it's think. part of the human condition. Then. Yes, yes. And although ultimately we recover our sanity, there are moments in human history when we are mm. not sane. Yeah, right. And that happens. Right. Yep. Yeah. People talked about it. I'm sure it was, it's part of the international reputation of the country. For right. Sure. But as a uh, at the same time, we don't know much about it, as you mentioned. And I don't think American kids, for instance, in college, did they learn about it? It's a recent history, 30 years ago. Um, we know about Vietnam War, or American War, but killing fields, you know, the massacre in know. Cambodia, they have nothing to do with me. But it was because of the um, political and war situation that U.S. caused, in a way. Yeah. And the people? Uh, what's your profile on the people? Uh, a friend of mine actually um, pays, uh, his wife is Cambodian, oh, and okay. you can see the connection, mm -hmm. but he pays to create schools in mm -hmm. Cambodia, mm -hmm. and he has several hundred students at his schools, the schools he's created. Mm -hmm. It's very nice. Right. His office is a block away from where we're sitting. And oh, so I, okay. I wonder, you know, what makes it, you know, the kids must be sweet, mm -hmm. uh, the people must be sweet, but oh, tell me what are. your profile is. Boy. Right. It, they're wonderful and then very friendly, very helpful, very uh, hardworking. That was my impression, but of course within a tourist group. Um, but uh, the, those uh, kind of helping, I think the country still needed. And 30 years is not a long time ago, and they do need more assistance and humanitarian uh, help. So when you go to Cambodia, do you see elements of uh, the Chinese as you do in northern Vietnam? Do you see elements of Vietnam? Do you see elements of Thailand? 
Is there a cross connection between these countries? You know, Cambodia, yes, we can see the uh, similarity, but Cambodians are historically Khmer people. They have totally different civilization from Chinese, mm -hmm. and Thai has different. So they are next to each other, but actually, they hate each other. <laughs> they use each other, and they're politically and economically think that their uh, cooperation is helpful. But I don't think, in a way, like Japan and Korea has a very complicated history. We are assimilated, we're we ma uh, married together, but not necessarily we're like this, right? right. So I sense a similar a difference there. Yeah, well, that, that was going to be a, a question I have to ask you. I ask everybody who who's been to that area, and I ask them, do you think there'll come a time in Southeast Asia, these countries, very countries, will become one, like the EU, will have trade agreements that are really tight, will have cultural connection, mm -hmm. and lots of free travel back and forth across the border, uh, where everybody intermarries, for example, mm -hmm. and, and creates a, a sort of Europe of Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. You see that as a possibility? Well, first of all, EU is one, I don't know, but... <laughs> <laughs> Probably in 200 years. <laughs> okay, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But why didn't you go to Laos? Uh, well, time constraint. Yeah. What, the, these three countries, was it a, a tour or did you specifically choose these three to go to? We specifically chose. Mm -hmm. We wanted to go here, we wanted to go here, but we'll be back. <laughs> we'll yeah. be back to these countries. So first time that you went? To... Uh, Vietnam, second time. Second time. Right. And that was a long time ago, or was that recent? Last year. Oh, so okay. we went to Blanc, and yeah. this year we went to Noir. <laughs> <laughs> fair is fair. Right. Balanced reporting. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, okay, this is a hard question, but I okay. do want to ask you, you know, go there, and you mm -hmm. spend the time, and you, you know, there's a certain amount of, I don't want to say risk in travel these days. Mm. You, you're sort of penetrating a barrier of some kind to make mm. a trip like that. And uh, okay, and, and then you you know get down with the people, you mm -hmm. meet them, you mm -hmm. enjoy them, all that, and you bring back a, a new a new piece in your life because mm. every trip it's beyond broadening and beyond finding sort of um, intellectual arbitrage. It's mm -hmm. more than that too. Mm. You bring back a new piece in your life. Mm. Now, so if I ask you, the day you arrived back in Honolulu mm -hmm. International, what was the piece that you brought back, Yukari? Mm, well, as you all experience, when you arrive in Honolulu International Airport, you look up the sky and go, God, so beautiful. <laughs> so that was my first impression. But my piece, any piece that, that I brought, is there are so many different countries and cultures and languages and food, people I need to experience, I want to experience, I want to grow more. That's the things that I wanted. So this is a time to travel, yeah. go places. Yeah. And if you're watching this, and if you have any time and money and space, go out there, especially young people. Go out there, see the world. You're not kidding either. I am not kidding. <laughs> I am serious. <laughs> Yukari Kunisui, the host of Konnichiwa Hawaii. Uh, thank you so much for coming and talking My to pleasure. me about thank this. Thank you. I'm honored. It's been a great discussion, much more than a travelogue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Yukari. Okay, thank you. Aloha.